Now, we had a guest speaker last weekend, but the two Sundays before that, we had started this little four-part series going through Matthew chapter 12 called The Boss. Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord over everything. Nothing and no one is above Him. Everything is under Him. It's all under His control. And so week one, we saw He bumps into the Pharisees, and they get upset with Him for Sabbath. They say that His disciples are violating Sabbath. They think Jesus is violating the Sabbath. And so they have some issues with them. And so they start plotting, and they're going to kill Jesus for blasphemy, because that was the punishment for disobeying the Sabbath. But what Jesus is demonstrating is that Sabbath wasn't meant to be this checklist of rules. Sabbath was a gift. It was a blessing. It was something that was given to them for their benefit. It was this way of life that leads to spiritual health and physical health. And so Jesus is trying to demonstrate that, and the Pharisees aren't having anything of it. And that's one of the reasons why it's so ironic that they get on him for healing someone on the Sabbath. The whole point of the Sabbath is health. And they're upset because Jesus dares heal someone on the Sabbath. And so one of the things we see there, Jesus calls himself Lord of the Sabbath. And so what that means is that anything, even the most holy ritual things, they're all under Jesus. The temple, the scripture, the Sabbath, it all falls under him. Then week two, we see how Jesus redefines what it means to be a leader. Matthew dips back into Isaiah and pulls this whole chunk of prophecy out to show us, hey, this is what Jesus is doing in his ministry here. And that leadership in the kingdom of God looks a lot like service. We tend to think of leaders, oh, leaders take charge and they do what they want and they get their way. And Jesus is showing us, no, leadership is actually serving others. And so that's an example that we can hold to ourselves in any leadership roles that we have. It's an example that we can hold to any other leaders that we're trying to evaluate. How do they stack up to the way that Jesus would lead? So we get this focus on leadership, Jesus' lordship, and that's why we've called this series The Boss. It's not about Bruce Springsteen, it's about Jesus, right? <laughs> he is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and He is the boss of bosses. Every knee will bend to Him and acknowledge Him. No one or no thing is above Him. And so this morning, we've got a huge chunk of Matthew chapter 12 that we're going to cover but you can't really break, and you need all of it at the same time. So we're just going to jump right in in verse 22. Matthew writes this. He says, Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people... Whoa, what happened there? I hit the wrong button. Nope. Yeah, whoop, burp, burp. There we go. We'll get there. Wait for it. There we go. Okay. Oh, it did it again. All right, Larry, can you just take over here for me? All right. And so it says, Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out. Therefore they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit 
will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So there's a lot going on there. And and there's probably some questions that you have, and don't worry, we'll get there. But there are three threads I want to kind of pull on here. The first is that Jesus is setting us up with this idea of two kingdoms. There are two kingdoms contrasted against each other. There's the kingdom of God, there's the kingdom of the devil. And they clash here in this passage as Jesus drives demons out of this man who was blind and mute. He's brought to Jesus, and Jesus heals him. He's deaf, he's blind, he's mute. Jesus drives the demons out. And we're told specifically that he's demon-oppressed. This isn't a guy who just happened to have those physical ailments. This is a guy who had something spiritual going on. It's not just a normal healing. This isn't your ordinary miracle, as though such an oxymoron were possible. (laughs) Right? And the crowd has an incredible reaction to this. We covered a very similar story to this way back in Matthew chapter 9 earlier this year. Here, Then Jesus heals a guy who's demon-oppressed and he's deaf, and the crowd's mind is just blown. And then here he goes one step further, Uh, And so back then, he does that miracle. The crowd's like, what? We've never seen anything like it. And then the Pharisees are like, he's doing the demon thing because of demons. And then here it comes up again. This one, it's even more spectacular because he's not just deaf. This time he's blind too. He couldn't hear or see, and now he does both. And the people see this, and they're just amazed. They're seeing something that they can't understand, that they can't explain. Like, can this be the son of David? Is it possible? Son of David was the term for the Messiah. Can can this really be the guy? They've got no other category for a miracle like this except that this guy might just be the Messiah. That's how blown away they are. There's, There's a little bit of reluctance in the way that they form this question. Like, Is it true? Like, this isn't the guy, is it? What they've seen is so amazing, there's no other possibility. And now, it's hard to kind of read a story like this and not get a little jealous, right? Like, think about it. Like, they got to see this. They got to witness Jesus do this. I mean, sure, we've got running water in the internet, right? (laughs) But they got to see Jesus do a miracle like this. How cool would that have been to be there and be astonished as Jesus does something we could have never imagined? And the Pharisees, of course, have a very different reaction to the crowd. One commentator, uh, whenever he mentions the Pharisees, he exclusively refers to them as the serious, which I love because that gets right to their mentality. And they see this and they're immediately going, okay, well, how do we explain this away? They're just grasping at straws here. So they've already made up their mind that Jesus is evil, and then he does this, and they're like, well, we've got to figure out a way to say that this is somehow evil. They've got to spin it, right? And so what they decide is, well, we're going to dig in our heels, and we're going to just attribute this to something evil. This is probably an example of the psychological um, concept called the backfire effect. It's this idea that when you encounter someone who's entrenched in their view on a specific issue, the more evidence that you like, give them that is against their stance, the more entrenched they become in their worldview. So it's not even just the more evidence you give, it doesn't make a difference. It actually makes them more convinced of their position, even if you give them evidence to the contrary. So that's why people still think the world is flat, right? <laughs> <laughs> there's no amount of math that you show them. There's no amount of like pictures from space that you can give them to prove them 
wrong, like everything you show them, they're like, nah, no, it's still flat. And so that's just a wild thing that our brains do. And it's good to know so you can maybe identify it in yourself if it starts happening, right? But the Pharisees are digging in despite Jesus doing this right in front of them. And so they've got to come up with a reason for it. And the only thing they can think is that, well, he must be driving out demons because of demons. Because that makes sense, right? Now, he says Beelzebul is who they attribute this to, which Beelzebul was, it, it appears to be the name of an old Canaanite god from like way back in the Old Testament that just over time in Jewish mythology became the prince of demons. And so they're essentially saying, well, Jesus is like in league with the prince of demons and is just sending demons out to do demon things, I guess. And so, whereas in chapter 9, Jesus sort of, like, he either doesn't hear it or doesn't address what they're saying, uh, but it goes, they say something like this and it goes unchecked. Here, Jesus is going to meet it head on. And what's interesting is that Jesus gives a logical argument to them. Like, it's not just a series of verses that Jesus says. This is why reading the Bible in context is so important, because he actually builds a logical argument as to why they're just completely wrong on this. He humors them far more than I would have, right? Because <laughs> I would have been like, yeah, yeah, I'm driving on demons because of demons. That makes a lot of sense, dum-dums. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Thankfully for you and me and everybody, I am not Jesus. So the argument that he makes first is that, look, a kingdom divided against itself isn't going to be able to stand. Yes, Abe Lincoln was quoting Jesus when he made that speech during his Senate run, which was unsuccessful, ironically. It's like one of his most famous speeches, and it lost him the race. But whenever there's a lack of unity in a kingdom or an organization or a cause, it's important that they stay, or whenever there's no unity, they struggle to stay together. They're going to come apart. That may just seem like conventional wisdom or common sense, but that's really kind of the point here, is that what the Pharisees are saying just doesn't make any sense. Why would the devil drive, drive out his own demons? You don't work against your own cause. The Packers aren't going to get in the huddle and be like, all right, Cobb, you run an in route here, and I'm going to throw the ball to the other team. Right? <laughs> like, if we just get like four or five interceptions, we'll have them right where we want them. Like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. Apparently, that was the Cavs' game plan this week, though. They, <laughs> If we commit 20 turnovers in the first half, then I'll stop crying eventually. <laughs> but no military is going to be like, look, here's what we do. We blow up a few of our own tanks, and then we're set. You don't do that. You don't work against your own cause. It doesn't make any sense. And so Jesus is pointing out, like, look, even Satan is not foolish enough to try to sabotage his own cause. You're, you're, this is transparent what you're trying to do here. Beyond that, Jesus points out, wait, Pharisees, don't you have students that cast out demons? He's like, right, so I'm doing this by demons. Okay, what do your guys do it by then? Are they demon-possessed too, your students? So you're, t you're teaching your students demon stuff? Is that what's going on here? <laughs> like he's, clearly the Pharisees have this category for people using the power of God to drive demons out. They're aware of this. Apparently, there are other people that are doing this. What's unique is that Jesus is doing this that other people, in a way that other people thought was impossible because they're astonished and they marvel whenever he does it. And so Jesus sort of baits them here. Like, okay, so either I'm doing them by demons and so your guys are doing them by demons or your guys are doing them by the power of God and I'm doing it by the power of God made that much stronger and more manifest in what I'm doing here. He's, they've kind of backed themselves into a corner. They're all playing checkers. Jesus is playing chess here, right? And so not only do their students do it, Jesus does it more powerfully. So clearly Jesus is more powerful. He's demonstrating the kingdom of God that much more clearly, that much more strong. So much that it should be obvious to them that the kingdom of God is present 
here in Jesus. And then in verse 29, he switches it up a bit. And then he says, Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. It seems like a weird aside that Jesus makes, right? Like, what does that have to do with anything here? And again, like, the observation seems a little bit obvious, right? If you're going to rob a dude's house and he's jacked, you got to tie him up first, or he's not going to let you just walk out with his stuff, right? There was a story a few years ago, this guy in the UK, who uh, he breaks into this man's house. Now, the guy whose house he's breaking into is like 72. He had made a noise complaint against this guy and the bar that he worked at, you know, a week earlier or whatever. And so he's like, well, I'm going to get back at him. I'm going to go break into his house and steal his stuff. So he enters the house. He comes in with a knife. And he encounters the 72-year-old guy in his hallway, and he takes a swipe at him with the knife. Now, thankfully, the knife misses. 72-year-old man does not miss. Little did this guy know, he was breaking into the house of a former junior boxing champion. (laughs) And so the old man lands two right hands and just drops him and holds him down until the police get there. The defense attorney said that the... uh, the hallway where the altercation had taken place looked like a crime scene (laughs) and that his client looked like he had been in a car accident. (laughs) He picked the wrong guy to rob. You're going to rob that guy, better tie him up first, right? And so why does Jesus mention this? Well, this is the spiritual reality of what Jesus is doing here in his ministry. He's not a tool of Satan. He's binding him up. Through his ministry here, he's tying him down. When Jesus rises from the dead, he just plunders him completely. But here in his ministry, he's tying him down. He's casting out these demons. He's setting the stage for him to just completely rob Satan of his kingdom. He's not being used by the devil. He's pummeling him mercilessly. Satan's kingdom is on wobbly legs, talking, taking shot after shot. And it doesn't look like a boxing match. It looks like a crime scene. And so it's, that, it's with the idea of those two kingdoms there that Jesus says the following then in the next verse, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There is no Switzerland here with Jesus. You are either for him or you are against him. There is no being neutral. We're all helping one kingdom or the other. It's like football. If your foot's on the line, you're out of bounds. You can't be a little bit for Jesus in the same way that you can't be a little bit pregnant. right? You either are or you aren't. And now, this may seem like it contradicts something that Jesus says in Mark's Gospel. I think it's worth looking at. We jump over to Mark chapter 9 and verse 38. Mark writes, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who is not against us is for us. So, the passage in Matthew makes it sound like, okay, if you're neutral, you're against him. Here, this makes it sound like, well, if you're neutral, you're for him. Well, which is it? And the difference here is in Matthew, it's whoever is not with me is against me. In Mark, it's whoever is not with us is for us. See, here's the difference. is The person casting out demons in Jesus' name in the Mark passage may not be with the disciples, but he's for Jesus. And the wisdom here is that we are exclusive to Jesus, but Jesus is not exclusive to us. And by that, I mean Lakeside is not the only church that is bringing people to Christ and making disciples. Converge, the church gathering that we're a part of, It's not the only gathering of churches or church denomination that is making authentic disciples of Jesus. It's not that like, well, we're just surrounded by false teachers, but praise God that with us, he got it right. Like, (laughs) 
Not everyone who claims Jesus knows him, sure. But by and large, they're all family. And so that's why at Lakeside, we don't view the other churches in our area as competition. It's all same team. We do things differently. We worship a little bit differently. That's okay. Because there will be people that will come to Lakeside and feel at home that would walk into another church in our community and be like, mm, this really isn't for me. And so, cool, you can come to Lakeside. And there'll be people that'll come into Lakeside and be like, eh, this really isn't for me. And then they'll go to another church in our community and feel more at home. Great. That's one of the good things about there being different kinds of churches, that we all get to worship according to our own consciences. And so Lakeside isn't the only church making disciples for Jesus. But at Lakeside, the only disciples we're interested in making are disciples for Jesus. So you're either for Jesus or you're against him. There is no in-between. There is no indecision. You have to, you have to make a call. You have to choose between one of two kingdoms. And here's the thing, is that Jesus ultimately reigns over both kingdoms. The kingdom of God is his and it advances through him. The kingdom of Satan, well, he's defeated it. And so he's ruler over all of it. And so then in the second paragraph here, Jesus gets a little bit more general, but he's still commentating on everything the Pharisee that's gone on with the Pharisees and their reaction here. He tells them, look, either be good trees with good fruit or be bad trees with bad fruit. Problem is, they think they're good trees, but Jesus is like, all I see is bad fruit. Tree gives you apples. It's an apple tree. If you're looking for oranges, you don't go to a maple tree. You're not going to be there, Right? The fruit tells you what kind of tree it is. And so the way someone talks reveals who they are. The Pharisees are using their speech to blaspheme Jesus. Clearly, this is bad fruit. And so Jesus gives yet another aphorism here that he sort of originates. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means the things that we say come from deep within. Speech is just the overflow of who we are. People are ultimately like a tube of toothpaste. So when you squeeze it, what's inside comes out. And so it's the same with us. When we're squeezed, when we're put through the ringer, whatever's inside us is the thing that's going to come out. When life gets hard, we don't slip up and say things that are totally out of character. When someone says, oh, I'm sorry I said that, that's totally out of character for me. What I mean by that is that's totally not the character that I want you to think that I am. <laughs> and that's something that Glenn touched on when he was here with us last week. He talked about the fruit of the Spirit, that when we center our lives around Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins developing these things in us. We begin to see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control those fruits start developing. And there's a word for that. We call it sanctification. If you've ever heard that word before, this is what it means. It's this word that means we're becoming more like Jesus. God's developing those characteristics in us. When we see ourselves growing in those areas, we know that the Holy Spirit's at work in our life. And so good trees produce good fruit, bad trees produce bad fruit. If someone's constantly negative, they're just a negative person. Someone only talks about themselves, like they're self-centered. Don't give those people the access to influence your life in key ways. We know what's inside based on what comes out. Judgmental people sound like judgmental people. Angry people sound like angry people. Like, oh, I just, I've got a temper. Like, no, you're an angry person. <laughs> And then Jesus makes a statement that really gives me some pause here. He says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Wow. Ever say something that you wish you could take back? I was out once with a friend of mine and her parents, and somehow my card tricks came up. I used to do them a lot. Uh, a lot more frequently when I lived in D.C. It was a big hit at parties. Like, I'm kind of a shy, introverted guy, and I could just, like, do card tricks, and it worked out, made it easy to talk to people. But anyway, I get to the story where I'm telling him about this time in college where, so I had this night class, and night classes were pretty long, so you get a break in the middle. And so during the break, I'm doing card tricks for people. 
things like that. And for whatever reason, one of the women in the class who was one of sort of the adult learners, like she was, you know, not a college freshman in college like the rest of us were. Uh, she's in the class and she has her pastor with her for whatever. He just wanted to sit in on the class or whatever and see what it was like. And so he comes in and um, as I'm telling this story to them while we're sitting down eating dinner, I, for some reason, mention like, oh, and the pastor, like, yeah, it's some really old guy. Like, I put emphasis on <laughs> some really old guy. Some of you know where this story's going already. And so, um, so during the break, I'm doing some card tricks and things like that. I'm, I'm telling them this story. I'm doing a, and as I'm doing the tricks, my hands are a little bit shaky because I'm just nervous, right? You get like performance jitters. You know, you're trying not to get caught doing your sneaky card moves and, uh, there's a big group of people around me at this point, and so, you know, I'm a freshman in college, so I just want people to like me, right? And so all these things are kind of, I'm just nervous. So my hands are shaking a little bit, and by this point, in the, as I'm telling this story, I begin to realize, I think I oversold the age of this gentleman. Like, <laughs> I think I put way too much emphasis on the really old thing. I never mentioned that, though, which is about to be key. And so, back in the story, I finished doing the card tricks, and everybody's really enjoying it. It's great. And then this pastor comes up to me and is like, you know why your hands shake when you do that? And I was like, yeah, it's like performance jitters. He goes, maybe someone's trying to tell you what you're doing is wrong. I was just kind of like, with all the grace of an 18-year-old college freshman, I was like, all right, dog. <laughs> <laughs> and so I kind of walk away and crack up at like how silly I thought that was. Now I've told the story, and uh, they're all amused at the, his reaction and stuff, and then the question comes out, so how old was this guy? And remember, in my head I've realized, ah, he maybe wasn't as old as I thought he was as I started telling the story, and then never said that to them. So what I did instead was go, I don't know, like 60? <laughs> and <laughs> now, of course, her parents are both in their like mid-50s at the time, and so they're kind of like, oh, really? So, <laughs> so 60 is really old, huh? And I was like, oh, I was so embarrassed, still am. It, <laughs> like, such a foot in my, like, they're in their mid-50s. I made it sound like I'm surprised they didn't lose their dentures in the guacamole or something. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, it's such a foot-in-mouth kind of moment for me. And so, yeah, there's all kinds of things that I've said that I wish I could take back. And more serious yet, though, I mean, there's all kinds of hurtful things that I've said to people that, man, I wish you say something and you know just right away, like, ugh. I want that back. I feel so bad. So many emails that I'm like, oh, I wish I hadn't hit send on that. Like so many times when I had said the wrong thing and I wish that I hadn't. So many things that I've said that were negative that hurt my witness. And Jesus is saying, look, one day we're going to have to answer for all of them. Every careless word is on wax. You're going to have to hear it. I know I don't look forward to that. Every time you said something flippantly that hurt somebody, every time you put someone down, every time you use words to tear someone down instead of build them up, we're all going to have to answer. But Jesus says that we're justified by our words, and thankfully we know exactly which ones, right? Because Paul says that no one can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Why? Because what's inside comes out. That's why in Romans... Paul says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart, we're saved. Because of that, that faith, when we put Jesus at the center of our lives, he begins that transformation. And that transformation then begins being reflected in our words. When we declare that Jesus Christ is Lord out of the overflow of faith deep inside us, what we're doing then, we claim that free gift of salvation that God has granted us in His grace. And now, I've saved the last of the threads here for the question that probably a lot of you had as we're going in. Um, what is the, Jesus talks about there's an unforgivable sin here. 
It says, look, everything will be forgiven, but this one thing won't be forgiven, which I think it makes sense then to ask, well, what is that? Let's take a look at it again. It's in verse 31, 32 here. It says, therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. And so what is this sin that cannot be forgiven? Well, the first thing we should notice here is that it begins with, therefore. So what is it there for? That means that what Jesus is saying here, it's not this little isolated thing on its own. It's connected to everything else that's been happening in this incident with the Pharisees. So when the Pharisees see Jesus casting out demons and healing people, and they say he's doing this by the power of the devil, that's what triggers Jesus saying, hold up, you better realize what you're doing here. And then he says, whoever's not with us, is a, whoever's not for me is against me. Therefore, watch yourself here. And so it's prompted by the Pharisees. It's prompted by what they've done here. So they've either committed this sin here or they're coming perilously close to doing so. And Jesus is bringing it up because of their actions. That's the first important thing to notice. Second thing is it seems to be an event. It's an action that someone can do. Because I've heard and I've read people describe it as well. Basically, you go your whole life without accepting Jesus. The Holy Spirit's been trying to work on you and trying to woo you and you've denied Him and so you've blasphemed against Him. And so then at the end of your life, you've committed that sin and it's not forgivable. So that is true to a degree, but that's, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. Because when he says whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, he's clearly not talking about a lifelong pattern. He's talking about an incident, a moment, a thing that you can do. And so I think it's also important to realize then also what comes after this passage about our words and our fruit. Because I, I think the English translations we have do a disservice to us here. Because if you've been looking at this in your Bible and your Bible app, when it, you have the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit section heading, and then it breaks again for the next paragraph and gives you another heading in my Bible. It says a tree is known by its fruit. Probably, depending on the translation you use, it has some similar heading there. I think that heading does a disservice to us because it makes us think that these two things are not as connected as they actually are. It's all one incident, and it's all one idea that Jesus is talking about here. And so, okay, but what is it, right? I know this is a source of concern for some people, and it shouldn't be, and we'll get to why in a little bit. But look at what the Pharisees did here. They're witnessing Jesus heal right in front of them. They're witnessing him driving out demons, and they decide that they're not going to accept this. They decide they're going to attribute that action to Satan. That's how just bonkers their thinking is at this point. They're watching the Son of God through the power of the Holy Spirit do incredible good works, and they're calling it evil. And so put it this way, they're having an undeniable encounter with Jesus in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And they know this, and they're willfully chalking it up as being the work of demons. And so they're not misunderstanding Jesus. They're understanding it completely. They're seeing good, and they're calling that good evil. They're so twisted in their thinking that Jesus warns that there might not be any hope for them anymore. So for us, what does that look like? John Piper defines it this way. He says, The unforgivable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is an act of resistance which belittles the Holy Spirit so grievously that he withdraws forever with his convicting power so that we are never able to repent and be forgiven. We wouldn't put a finer point on it. I'd say it like this. 
blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is when you have an undeniable encounter with the Holy Spirit and out of malice, not ignorance, deem it to be evil. All of those parts are important. It has to be undeniable and it has to be not out of ignorance. Remember, Jesus is crucified and he's hanging on the cross and he sees the men who have put him there and says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. You can't blaspheme against the Holy Spirit on accident. And it has to be malicious. It has to be this conscious decision to attribute the work of God to evil. And so this takes this incredibly twisted and demented sort of mind and soul. To see undeniable good. And remember that undeniable is important and call it evil, shows that you just might be too far gone. That your hearts become so hardened that the Holy Spirit just withdraws entirely. And so when people are worried that they've committed this sin, I would say, well, the fact that you're worried is the first evidence that you have not. Because someone who would do this would not worry that they have committed this sin. If it bothers you even a little, you are undoubtedly not guilty. And I also think about the many people who have sort of attempted to do this. There was this YouTube craze that was going on years ago where atheists were recording themselves blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, which shows just like how twisted someone's thinking has to be. And as I mentioned you know, a few weeks ago, like the two tenets of atheism are one, God does not exist, and two, I hate him, right? But even in their state, I think that their sheer ignorance prevents them from being unforgivable. They really have no idea what they're doing. If they had a real encounter with the Holy Spirit, maybe they'd feel differently. It is possible, though, in our worry and our shoegazing over this unforgivable sin, to miss the good news that's lurking in this passage. In verse 31, Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Think about that. You realize what this means? This means that no matter what you've done, you are not outside of God's love. People sometimes think like, oh, well, God, he wouldn't want me. I've done too many things. Like, I'm too bad. He can't. He just he doesn't want me. I'd like to point them here. There is nothing, nothing that can prevent God from forgiving you. Jesus prays for forgiveness for the men that are killing him. Like, is there anything worse that you can possibly imagine? The Son of God comes to earth in human form, and their interaction with him is driving spikes through his wrists. And Jesus prays for them, God forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so I don't care what you've done, and you know what? God doesn't either. His grace is big enough for any sin we could possibly bring to Him. And His sacrifice in Jesus is big enough to cover all of it. And all we have to do to receive that gift is repent, to ask for forgiveness, to set our hearts and our minds on Him, to believe in our hearts that Jesus is the Son of God, that He has risen from the dead, and then to express that with our words. If you've never taken that step before, man, today could be the day. And if you have any questions or you want to just talk to somebody, man, I'd love to talk to you after service about that. There is nothing that we can do that will keep Him from forgiving us. Nothing. No sin too big. No life too... It doesn't matter. I'm too bad. You're not. Not even close. No matter what you've done, I can find 
oodles of people in this Bible that were worse. And that God changed and used. That He gave His grace to that received that and grew and showed fruit and were transformed and were sanctified. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that You are the King of everything. There is nowhere we can go. There is nothing we can do that puts us outside of Your reign and Your rule. And that for all of us in here this morning, that You still extend Your grace to every single one of us. That if we place our faith in You, You will wrap Your arms around us and embrace us and transform us. Lord, help us to run to You We thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen.